and the drugs won't stay down There's a burning, there's a burning, there's a burning I found It's deep in the pit where the blood pumps around All the children are laughing outside The work never sleeps and there's nowhere to hide It's under control, far as anyone's seen But there ain't enough shit to climb out the luxury There's a witness, there's a witness, there's a witness out there We've got to pretend that the money's still here There's a knocking, there's a knocking, there's a knock at the door We'll tell them that uncle don't live here no more All the angels are crying downstairs The brandy's run out, but their God never cares He'll slap them and tell them the evening's been ruined And his road freak of failure and cheap things will view There's a tinkering, there's a tinkering, there's a tinkerer in town She'll fix everything till the money's been found There's a watchman, there's a watchman, and he's guarding the door With a drink in his hand and a gun on the floor And the monster's broken through the sewers again And they spend every night making ever more friends They've conquered the bowels of Paris and now They have every intention of taking the town There's a bottle, there's a bottle in my bed It helps me to reach for the switch in my head There's a madness, there's a madness at bay But a cold wind will blow down the levee someday A train whistle blows, the conductor's been hanged In a white little house, a red telephone rang And it's under control, far as anyone's seen But there ain't enough shit to climb out the luxury guys it's the 22nd of August 2018 it's quarter to 11 in the morning on a warmish sunny late winter day and I'm on the Bluff Hill in Napier overlooking the harbour region of the Napier waterways you're listening to podcast number 25 and the title of this podcast is Ramon Lull So if you want to understand the Western Hermetic alchemical tradition, you first got to understand where that tradition came from. Because the origin of the tradition defines for us the actual nature of the tradition itself. In other words, what it is that alchemists do, and what they think, and what they teach. Their philosophy and their practice. So when we mark the beginning of the Western Hermetic tradition, we actually know the year, the month, and the actual day when the first book on alchemy was published in Latin, which was the language that European scholars read and wrote and spoken. We know that it was 1144, and that the guy who published the book was an Englishman by the name of Robert of Chester. And Robert of Chester was what was known as an Arabist. In other words, he studied Arabic culture, 
and he spent a lot of time translating Arabic texts into Latin and probably other languages as well, but primarily into Latin. And so this guy, Robert of Chester, this Englishman, was the first individual to translate an Arabic book called The Composition of Alchemy into Latin. And this book was the first introduction of the subject of alchemy to Western intellectual Western culture, people who could read. So it was the first time that Western Europeans had been exposed to the idea of alchemy. So when we say this, we have to understand that this is an academic assessment of the situation, because the reality of the introduction of alchemy into Western Europe is that it probably existed for a long, long time beforehand. Pagan cultures probably knew something about it before the Romans and before Christianity. But when we're talking about the um, re-kickstarting of Western culture after the Dark Ages, Robert of Chester was the guy who first introduced the concept of alchemy to the Western mind. So Robert of Chester published this book, 1144 AD, roughly around the same time as the First Crusade. So we can match up those two concepts again and say that by the time the First Crusade began, we know that esoteric knowledge started drifting into Western Europe from the Middle and Near East. And this business with Robert of Chester is one of the proofs that that was actually happening. The very next individual that is important to us, well there's actually two or three individuals that are important to us, but we're going to focus on one of them mainly, is um, a, a Spanish guy who was born roughly about 1233 and died around 1311. So he was alive and doing his thing about a hundred years after Robert of Chester had published the first book on alchemy in Western culture. So alchemy had a hundred years to develop before Ramon Lull got involved in that scene. Now we have to be careful when we discuss the subject of Ramon Lull, the Spanishman who was born in Mallorca in around 1233, because historically he is, his history is owned by the Catholic Church because he became um, a Franciscan tertiary during his lifetime after he had a number of visions of Christ and decided that he needed to clean up his life and um, go on a spiritual mission. So the Catholic Church and modern academia tell us that the historic and religious Ramon Lull was not an alchemist. And they base this entirely on the concept that in one of his books, Ramon Lull said that he did not believe in alchemy. Now, anybody who is familiar with esoteric culture in the 13th century, at the time of Ramon Lull, will know that it was easy to get yourself in a great deal of trouble with the church if you admitted being involved in the study of forbidden subjects, such as alchemy or other occult subjects. So to suggest that the historic and Christian Roman lull was not the alchemist Roman lull is kind of a long shot and it is ignoring the conditions that existed during that guy's lifetime where a, the study of occult knowledge was concerned because most occultists had to keep their study of occult knowledge secret and a lot of them had taken oaths of secrecy and belonged to secret societies or where alchemists were concerned they often had to take an oath of secrecy 
where their teacher or their master was concerned. So to say that um, Ramon Lull, the, the historic Christian Ramon Lull, was not an alchemist because he wrote in one of his books that he didn't believe in alchemy uh, is not a definitive uh, assessment of the situation. Nevertheless, around the same time that the historic Roman lull existed, allegedly a number of texts were produced that discussed in depth a very important stream of alchemical knowledge. And those texts were entitled, their authorship was entitled Roman, Ramon Lull. These texts didn't start appearing in public until about the 14th century, so that's a little bit suspicious in itself. But alchemists around that period and of a later date certainly treated these texts like they were produced by the historic and Christian Roman Lull. So in academic circles, two individuals are talked about the historic Christian Roman Lull and another guy who took Ramon Lull's name and produced important alchemical texts under that name. Now if that was true, if there were two individuals, one of them was not Roman, Ramon Lull but used Ramon Lull's name as the author of the text that he wrote on alchemy, we're lacking some kind of feasible explanation why an anonymous author would want to produce alchemical texts under the name of a controversial religious figure, because the historic Roman lull was controversial, and a guy who had apparently denounced in his writings um, the viability of study of alchemy. So why would you want to produce books under the name of a guy who was a bit of a rogue, who was infamous in his behaviour and who had said that he didn't believe in alchemy? So um, historic alchemists from the early periods of the Western alchemical tradition insisted that there were not two people for them, it was the original Roman lull, and they insisted this on the basis that any denial of involvement or alchemy or any lack of evidence simply came down to the fact that we all know that a lot of alchemists at that time studied in secrecy, especially individuals who were involved in the church like the historic Roman lull was. Okay, so here is the the, well, here is what we do know about the texts that were produced. That they didn't start appearing in manuscript and published form until about the 14th century. In other words, that was a hundred years after the historic Roman Lull's um, life and death. These texts, there were quite a number of them, around 20 or 30. They were all relatively short, and generally speaking, they all described a very specific path to um, the, the great work and the Philosopher's Stone. So because Ramon Lull was one of the first people that started publishing texts on the early Western Hermetic alchemical tradition, his ideas and his writings were copied and quoted frequently after his lifetime. And because they were so regularly copied and quoted, these concepts, these core ideas that Ramon Lull uh, wrote about became entrenched in the early and then later development of the Western alchemical tradition. And we need to understand, if we are going to understand 
the reality of the Western Hermetic tradition, what it is that Ramon Lull believed, and the way he discussed those ideas. But before I go into any depth about Ramon Lull's ideas, we need to be also be aware that at the exact same time that Ramon Lull was alive, there was another individual whose name has been anglicised to Arnold de Villanova, who was born almost at the same time as Ramon Lull and died almost at the same time. So they were contemporaries. Uh, Arnold de Villanova studied medicine in France and became a very famous uh, medical doctor, famous for curing not only uh, numerous types of illness but also famous as a physician to a number of popes and kings. No one is sure where Arnold de Villanova was born so they're not sure about his nationality but we know he died in Genoa in Italy and like I said that was around the same time a few years before or after Ramon Lull died. The same thing is said about Arnold de Villanova that it is claimed that he was an alchemist in the Hermetic tradition but that in fact he wasn't an alchemist because there was no evidence of him being one in the records of his life. So this starts to become a little suspicious when academics keep saying things like this because you can't just keep pointing your finger at every person who was historically claimed to be an alchemist but there are no extent records in their from their lives of them having been involved in the alchemical tradition and just write, them, write that um, claim off one after another. Because for example, it was, um, it's now relatively common knowledge that the famous scientist Isaac Newton who invented calculus, which is one of the most important forms of mathematics that we have today, was also heavily involved in alchemical study and practice. And that academics for a long time hid that information from the public until eventually about five or eight years ago, his, uh, his manuscripts came up for sale in auction and there were all these alchemical diaries found which then um, were examined by the scientific and scholarly community. And an admission had to be made then that the man who was considered to be the pillar of modern science, one of the main pillars of modern science, was in fact a believer and a practicer of alchemy. But at the end of the day, the important thing is not the individuals so much themselves, but the records of the knowledge that they left behind, the manuscripts and the texts that we still have access to today. And the question of whether these texts are viable, and if they are viable, how much of an impact have they had on the Hermetic tradition. And we know two important things, that Arnold de Villanova is claimed to have published a number of important books, two of which are very important to the alchemical tradition, the Rosarium Philosophorum and the Nova Lumen. And both of these books had a massive impact on the original Western alchemical tradition and the later development of the ideas which were contained in the Hermetic Western alchemical tradition. The same situation happens to um, with Lully's um, manuscripts that no matter who it was who produced those writings the writings themselves are of absolute importance where the Western Hermetic alchemical tradition is concerned because even today concepts which are taken for granted as being core fundamental ideas of important in Western alchemy began with Ramon Lull. Therefore not only were his concepts accurate 
and then important to the practical tradition but they were also important because of the influence that they had over the whole tradition. So th these are the first important concepts to understand about Ramon Lal and Arnold de Villanova, that both of these men were studying the same process to the stone, which was the acetate path. They saw that process in the same way, although they expressed their understanding of the process in different language. In other words, it is highly likely that the source of their knowledge was very much the same. So this is where we come to the point of talking about what it was about Lull that was important to the Western, later Western Hermetic tradition. The important thing about Lal was that he described his understanding of the acetate path and various different kinds of processes that surrounded the acetate path and were connected with it in an allegorical language which was based on the process of wine making and the manipulation of wine. This is very important because we see these wine references pop up regularly and being used in the same kinds of way right down through the history of the acetate path from the 13th century right into the end of the 19th century. For example, one of the key concepts that Ramon Lull discussed in his writings was the production of a special solvent which he said was, had its origin in the vegetable realm, the vegetable or the plant kingdom. And he likened this solvent to what we today would call ethanol or spirit of wine. In other words, the alcohol that is in wine or fermented grapes. So Lull drew an analogous comparison between the special secret solvent that he had and the spirit of wine. In fact, we get the term spirit of wine from Ramon Lull's writing, where he called the secret solvent spiritus vini, or the spirit of wine. Now, people who didn't understand the nature of the use of allegorical ciphers in historical alchemical texts would often read texts like lulls and take them literally instead of understanding that they were ciphers designed to hide the true names of chemical substances. So it so happened that when lulls writings about a hundred years after his death started to become famous through an individual called Sir George Ripley, who was an Englishman. He made Lull's writings famous again. A lot of people started reading them. And when they saw this cipher term, Spiritus Vinny, they thought it, it was literally referring to the spirit or the solvent which was distilled from wine. In other words, wine alcohol, ethanol. Therefore, this is where we get the name spirits for top shelf beverages, liquor, hard liquor, and where we get the name Spiritus Vinny from. It all came from a misunderstanding and misrepresentation of the cipher word that Ramon Lull used for a substance which was actually the chemical name for which was 
actually acetone, which is a ketone. So he didn't want to tell people what this acetone was or where it came from unless they had been properly initiated into alchemy. So as I said, he covered his tracks and he covered the true name and description of this chemical in a cipher which was based on winemaking. So in Ramon Lull's time and Arnold de Villanova's time, the best known way of producing acetone was through the heat decomposition of organic substances. Not all organic substances, but specifically what is known as metallic acetates <clears throat> and I'm going to get into a fuller more detailed description of these chemical terms later. It's not important to understand them now, what's important to understand is the um, background concepts here. So Lull was talking about the production of acetone through heat decomposition of metallic acetates and because this was not a well-known process in Europe at the time and was considered to be a secret of like one of the deepest secrets of the alchemical tradition he hid his descriptions of how acetone was produced through heat decomposition or what we know as pyroly pyrolysis in an allegory about winemaking when you take a metallic acetate and you heat the hell out of it so that its molecules break down under the pressure of that heat, four basic chemical conditions distill off that metallic acetate. We get water, or H2O. We get acetone, which is a well-known chemical if you know of, if you know what uh, nail polish remover is, that, that smell, that's acetone, <clears throat> and we get a an oil-like substance which is primarily a mixture of phenols and some other substances, and we get some um, volatile salts. The, when the acetone is being distilled, it comes over as a white fume, like smoke and um, condenses into a clear liquid which looks exactly like alcohol and has properties which are very similar to alcohol. When the red oil is distilled over, it, f it first comes over as a red fume and then it comes over as red drops like blood and then congeals into a, a, a red oil. Or if it's in the acetone, it's a golden... Uh, colour in, in the acetone itself. Ramon Lull referred to these two substances, the acetone and the phenol impregnated oil, as red and white wine because they have a nature that's kind of symbolically or allegorically similar to red and white wine. Not the same, but similar. And um, it just so happens that you can discuss the techniques of producing these two white fume, uh, these two fumes, the red and the white, in the language of wine making and wine distillation, which is exactly what Lull did. The other side to using this wine making and wine manipulation allegory was that as we all should be aware there are a lot of biblical references to grapes to grape vines to viticulture wine husbandry and to the making of wine and the drinking of wine also in the new testament in the gospels christ himself uses the concept of viticulture as an allegory to explain his own relationship to God, 
and the relationship of God and himself to mankind and to the initiate tradition. So in the gospel tradition, in the secret or esoteric gospel tradition, there is also the use of the allegory of wine husbandry and wine making as a reference to the secret tradition, to the tradition of initiation and the search for illumination. So for example, we can see in one of the uh, engravings that was inserted into one of Thomas Vaughan's book, an engraving which was titled The Typical School of Magic, where he shows an image of an initiatory scene and the magic mountain of initiation. We can see at the top of that magical mountain is uh, a number of bunches of grapes in reference to the summit of initiation, the highest point Reach. that you can reach, and the abode of the illuminated. He himself also makes this little understood and recognized allegorical reference to wine husbandry and wine making and to grapes and viticulture. So <clears throat> besides the fact that the language of wine making and viticulture could easily be used by Ramon Lal to disguise his discussions of the process of the acetate path. It was also a religious and spiritual uh, facet to using that wine making language as well. So of course that was extremely beneficial to Lal because he was taking the alchemical tradition from the Middle East and Near East into Western Europe into a largely Christian dominated society and into an esoteric society which was also dominated by Christian concepts and ideals. Arnold de Villanova didn't use this wine making allegorical language. His language largely revolved around a kind of pseudo sexual symbolism and we can see that in the Rosarium Philosophorum where most of the images, the, where the woodcut images in the Rosarium largely are groups of pictures showing the various juxtapositions of the relationships between the male and the female concepts in the great work process. So while Lull was using the allegorical language of winemaking and viticulture in order to disguise his descriptions of the acetate path process, Arnold de Villanova had a different way of covering up that information, of enciphering it. If we look at the woodcuts in his most famous text, the Rosarium, Philosophorum, we can see out of these 2021 woodcuts, a good number of them show images of a king and a queen, either clothed or naked, in various positions and relationships to each other. While Lull talked about the white and red fumes, as if they were white and red wine, Arnold de Villanova talked about the white and the red fumes as if they were a king and a queen. De Villanova was not proselytizing some kind of alchemical sex cult, as has been claimed by people who have a predisposition towards an interest in sexual magic. He was discussing the binary relationship between the two poles of the alchemical great work using images of males and females. And I'll be going into both Lully's side and Arnold de Villanova's side of this cipher symbolism language in more detail as we go through the um, coming podcasts. So I think that's enough 
for this podcast. It's probably a little shorter than I intended it to be. But as the weather report predicted, it's getting cloudy and it's also getting cold. And it's late winter still here, even though it looks like spring. So that's enough for today. And in the next podcast, podcast number 26, I will begin discussing the actual details of the great work in the way that Ramon Lal liked to describe them in his text. So we're actually going to get into the practical lab chemistry side from the next podcast on. Thanks again for watching and see you in the next one. There's a churning, there's a churning, there's a churning around I can't fall asleep and the drugs won't stay down There's a burning, there's a burning, there's a burning I found It's deep in the pit where the blood pumps around All the children are laughing outside The work never sleeps and there's nowhere to hide It's under control, far as anyone's seen But there ain't enough shit to climb out the luxury There's a witness, there's a witness, there's a witness out there We've got to pretend that the money's still here There's a knocking, there's a knocking, there's a knock at the door We'll tell them that uncle don't live here no more All the angels are crying downstairs The brandy's run out, but their God never cares He'll slap them and tell them the evening's been ruined And his road freak of failure and she breaks with you There's a tinkering, there's a tinkering, there's a tinkerer in town She'll fix everything till the money's been found There's a watchman, there's a watchman, and he's guarding the door With a drink in his hand and a gun on the floor And the monsters broke in through the sewers again And they spend every